So here we are. Hello, hello. I don't know if anyone's on. Some people may have given up and thought I would never come. I am in fact here. I'm plugging in my Wi-Fi, so if it weirdly kicks me off, I'm sorry. Okay, it looks like it started. My phone just notified me. Um, if you watch our videos and like them, please um, hit subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell. That will let you be notified if anyone, um, if we post a video. So anytime we post a video or we go live, it'll show up on your phone. Not only is that great for you, but it's also actually super helpful for us because um, it just gives the YouTube algorithms things to look at and see that things are happening. Um, so if people are there and people are clicking on stuff, um, then it just helps the, it just helps. It helps um, YouTube to go, ooh, this is something, and they might recommend it to someone else that normally wouldn't. Um, so it helps us and it helps other people. Um, is also really important because they may see this content. You can help share this with people that you don't even know by um, notifying, hitting the notification button or subscribing. So that is that. Hmm. I, hello. I'm not seeing anyone on yet, which may just be because our newsletter just went out, but that's okay. Um, or it may just be because it's crazy because it's spring and here we all are. I'm just making sure I'm on the right night. I think I am. Yep. Okay. We are here. Gardening for gaps. So my thought about talking about stuff tonight, good news for the length of this video, for people who don't like longer videos, um, I'll still be longish, but um, I am not an expert gardener. However, I have been learning and I've had some really cool opportunities um, about learning, which I want to kind of share um, some ideas about things that you may find to be helpful um, as you are. Sorry, I'm going to get my notes ready in case I think of things to talk about uh, that I, that I'm, yeah. I'm just going to have a note thing. Sometimes I think of something in the middle and I don't want to interrupt what I'm saying. So, um, so resources for why you, where you could learn about gardening, um, not just being a gardener. Um, I didn't grow up. As a gardener, my mom did a little bit of gardening, but nothing major. And I helped weed, but we didn't live in the house where we had a big garden long enough for me to learn any of the rest of it, any of the planning. And my mom also did not start seeds. So I didn't know anything about that. Um, I just felt like that was really impossible and difficult. And why would you even do that? So I didn't come with a lot of experience gardening, but there were different resources um, and places that I had opportunities to, and they made me comfortable in different ways and helped me learn not just skills, but also comfortability <coughs> with how things work, which was super helpful. Um, so that's what we want to talk about. Number two, I want to talk about why we would garden for gaps. So gaps diet has a very specific type of food that's maybe very different from what you were eating when you ate a standard American diet. Um, and what you garden for gaps would be very different than what you would garden for yourself. So um, gardening for gaps, I think, is a super helpful um, concept to talk through. Again, like a lot of things I talk about, um, there's pieces that are new and information to know, but most of it's not rocket science. Most of it is that we haven't put those things together. Um, in that way, or we haven't thought through it, or we haven't thought through it specifically. I can't believe I never thought about what you would put in a garden for gaps different than what you would put in a garden normally until just the last year. Um, but last year, I really did think about it. I was planning to garden before COVID hit. It's important for me to say. <laughs> for my, uh, it's important for me to clarify. I was planning to garden anyway, but um, yeah, that was super helpful to think about that. And I have some things I did last year that I want to build on or would do kind of, not differently meaning I messed up, but like more things or different things because it was, it's a refining. Okay. The third thing I want to talk about is a little bit about why we eat the dense foods that we do. And I may not do this in these orders. Just been thinking about these three topics today. 
Um, so why do we eat these dense foods? Why can we garden differently? So um, that is what I'm gonna talk about. So let's start there actually, because it's a great place to start. Um, so when we are looking at foods for gardening for gaps, one of the things that is very different is you garden for things that are fermentable, that your family ferments, um, which would be different than if you were canning or if you were just eating for now, not storing really anything. Um, and so <clears throat> when you are planning your garden for gaps, so there's some things that we all eat on the gaps diet that are the same, <clears throat> but there are some things that we eat that are different. So you need to eat ferments. You can eat any number of ferments. Now, most of us are going to eat sauerkraut on a regular basis, vast majority, right? So eating cabbage is going to be a great plan. Um, eating cabbage is going to be, or planting cabbage, sorry, wow. I had a lot of appointments today. My brain's a little tired, I'm sorry. Um, so cabbage is a great crop to grow. I grew a lot of cabbages last year. It was very interesting to do that because I didn't, I didn't know why I was going to do that. I mean, I thought about it. I didn't know how it was going to turn out. And this was, this was a plan. I apologize for everyone watching this video. I know my brain is at like 70% right now. So be patient. Um, the reason why we're talking about this, um, Holly and I are both really excited about showing different things about gardening, connecting with gardeners, um, and connecting with resources. Let's go to resources first because my brain keeps jumping there, and we'll talk about the why dense foods. I also feel like you guys know. If you watch my channel, you know we need dense foods. We eat different foods. Yeah, you know why we need cabbages and that why we would plant a whole bunch of cabbages. I had a lot of people like, why did you plant so many cabbages? I'm like, our kraut? Hello? <laughs> you guys would not ask that question because that would be very clear to you. Um, so that's kind of the biggest thing. We'll just say we need dense foods. Oh, let me say this. We need dense foods, which we know. But what I don't talk about as much is number one, food grown locally is good, not just for the economy, but it's good because those plants are under the same conditions, toxins, light, soil, humidity, their stressors are your stressors. So if you are growing food, they are going to resource themselves and create essential oils um, and, and uh, what's the word I want? Energy, their energy kind of matrix, if you will, which is a part of food, is there's an energy matrix. I never heard anyone call it that, but it's a fairly descriptive term. So there's this energy that you're eating with plants. It's more than just building blocks of nutrition and chemicals. There is a component of, of energy that goes together. So um, when you eat plants that are local, and you can't get more local than your own backyard, then you are actually giving your body more than just good dense building blocks, which is helpful, but you're giving it that energy, those essential oils, the 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 plant has worked on its ability to survive in this environment, and that is what it's helping you with when you eat it. So number one, really great to do that. Number two, um, we eat dense foods, not just on gaps to heal, right? We do it to heal. We do it to give nourish our body. We do it for energy, and we do it because we can control what is in our soil. Same reason why we make food um, from scratch, from one ingredient, because you know what's in that thing. So when you grow and you decide what the soil mixture is and you decide to put fish, three, two, one fish or whatever I bought from Azure um, on your soil as a fertilizer instead of a even organic bio fertilizer, um, you decide to put your kitchen scraps in, which are also organic. So, you know, your compost is organic. You decide to buy some worms. You decide to put some fungi in your soil to create the my cosiome colonies that are on the root system that help your plants absorb food better, right? You get to do that. You get to monitor it and you get to learn about it. At the same time, you get exposure to microbiome. You get exposure to um, all of the soil um, microbes, the nutrition, the energy, um, the sunshine, like you get all of that. So it's incredibly beneficial. Now, can everyone's life do it? No. 
Can most people's life do it? I don't want to argue yes. I think most people can. I'm not going to call it for you, and I do not want you to feel guilty if you are not able to garden or you're feeling like that's just too much because of your situation. You are the best assessor of that, and you are right in your assessment. Um, there may be some things I want you to consider that are you having the right priorities? Are you thinking of it in a different way that's overwhelming? Or are you just overwhelmed? And if you learned some things, it would be easier. That's where I was. I thought I could never garden. There's no way I could garden. I'm currently in the busiest season of my work life that I've ever been in. And I was last year too. And I managed to have a really good garden. It was much easier because I had good soil and I had good plan for watering. And I, I grew strong plants because I used the lunar calendar. Like there are these things that I did that kind of, I don't know, they didn't cheat because it's just using your resources, right? But it, it made it so much easier than so many people have. And I want to share some of those things that I've learned. Um, I am not in any way a master gardener, but it's really cool because the principles of nutrition are the same in the body and in the soil and in the plant. The principles of energy and good energy and love and care and positivity are the same in your plants as you. Um, and so there's so much that it just it's just the same. Um, so in many ways, it's it's easier it's easier for me to walk into gardening now than when I first started. Okay, so we garden for gaps. One, because we eat dense foods and it's important. Two, because we want to know where the food comes from. Three, because the local environment provides extra things beyond nutrition. It provides energy and knowledge about survival in our current environment that strengthens our body and allows us to perform better and, and be stronger in our environment. So that's all great. Okay, number three. Find nutrient-dense foods. I think that's all for that category. Okay, so let's go to, we're gonna use the practice at the end. Let's go to resources that are helpful. So if you look at the prospect of gardening in your life, and we are talking about like you get to decide if this is right for you. So here's some questions that I would challenge you to ask yourself and be honest about your opinion. And don't let my opinion about this cause you to have a different opinion because you need to, you know, I believe that you know what's best in your life. And if you are overwhelmed with life, maybe you need to learn something. Maybe you could go um, somewhere else. So when I first started learning to garden, what I consider my like actual training in gardening, training, so formal. There, my neighbor had a has a CSA well, where I used to live, she still has it. Um, I used to live by her. She has a CSA that is um, in backyards of neighbors in the downtown area. It's great, plenty heirloom farms, lovely. She wrote a book called The Thrifty Good Life. Sarah Saylor is her name, love her, she's awesome. I met her because we live four doors away from each other and she's just super sweet, brought me along. I'd met her before at a homesteading natural health talk that I had a booth at. Um, and she took me under her wing to help. So really, I came to help her a little bit on Tuesday mornings or something like that. Um, and I pulled weeds and took home a little bit of produce for my efforts. So that was really lovely. Um, what I learned, what I gained from that. Number one, I learned how to harvest things, which was always a weak point. I had done a little bit of gardening and I had done weed pulling with my mom, but I never had harvested. And I am a person just in general that tends to store well and harvest poorly <laughs> and utilize things poorly. So I'll have a freezer full of meat and I'll go to the store and buy things at the store. It took me years before I would utilize what was in my freezer instead of going and buying something at the store because it just was a habit change. So it was a big deal for me to do that. So I learned how to harvest. I learned that you keep cutting lettuce and it keeps coming back. I learned at what stage you cut lettuce. I learned how to wash it so that it would store really well for a while. I learned which way to store it so that it would keep for a week or two. Like they, these were things I learned. I learned just from talking to her about um, seed starting and when she has started and what kind of things she does. And that I learned more from other people as well. Um, but it was my first introduction. Um, but for me, it was most important to do the thing that was challenging and felt like a failure and a waste of time, which was I would grow food. I had done it a couple of times before, and then it would go bad either in my fridge or in my garden because it was so 
outside of the normal and it was different from the store. There were things I did like I put lettuce in a bag like I would from the store because then in my brain I could use it easier. So there are lots of things I learned about working with Sarah. Um, I also learned about weed management and lasagna set up for your gardening, which is actually not the way I use it, but I use a similar, it's, it's fairly similar, just a little differences. Um, the no kill method, which I think is the best way to, to garden because um, it doesn't break up the microbiome, things like that. So I learned it, but the biggest thing for me working with Sarah and with Plenty Heirloom Farms was to be comfortable so that I knew what to do and it wasn't scary and big anymore. So for me, and for you, I want you to ask yourself, what is your biggest barrier to gardening? Is it really time or is there another fear or worry or insecurity or just lack of education that you don't know? You don't know what to do. And so you're avoiding doing it because it's something that's new, scary, big. You don't want to waste your time. What if it all crashes, right? What if the hail comes and destroys everything? Like, what does that look like? So number one, is there a barrier is time truly your barrier or is there something else? Number two, if you are have no barriers, but time is an issue or a consideration and you're deciding, do I want to do this or not? Here's some considerations that I would have you think about. Number one, it's not just about growing food. Now, there is, I believe, a very priceless aspect to growing your own food, which I discussed earlier, right? It's energetically better. It is nutritionally better. You know what's in it. You got it. And then there's a pride. And for your kids, they will eat things out of the garden. Many kids eat things out of the garden that they won't eat from the store because we are designed to connect with the process of our food. Okay, so there's lots of benefits like that. Um, there are benefits of being in the sun. If you're supposed to sunbathe every day, why not garden too? 15, 20 minutes, it's not that long. And you can get a lot done in the garden if you do that every day. That's probably manageable for most days to only spend 15 or 20 minutes in the garden. You get to be in the dirt and in the soil, which will improve your microbiome, ground you, improve your um, yeah, you know, vibrational frequency. It helps to detox you. Like there's so many things that happen when you're touching the soil, when you're working in the soil, and when you're outside. Um, it gets you off your phone and off your computer. <laughs> it gives your eyes a break. Um, it slows your pace down. It is quiet. Um, you can listen to a book or something like that. I often do. But there's sometimes where I, I'm quiet, and I'm not very good at quiet. I have to be in a pretty peaceful and relaxed state to be in a place of quiet, something that I work on and I have to keep working on. But um, I can get there a lot faster when I'm gardening because there's something to do with my hands. Um, something to do with my mind and it's, it's just nice. So I'll do that. You can be outside and maybe meet your neighbors if you're gardening in your front lawn, like I'm going to be. Um, you can learn new things. You can try varieties of seeds and plants that you are never going to get in the store. I wouldn't necessarily, unless you were excited about it. Um, for me, maybe next year I'll try some new varieties, but it's just too overwhelming for me. I can only do so much change at once. <laughs> I like change. I thrive in change. There's only so much I can handle. And when I'm doing something new, that can be very paralyzing for me. So I am not, I'm going to do some new things or different things or more things, but I don't think I'm going to grow a new variety of vegetable. It seems really, really hard to figure out how to get seeds or even find seeds that you put in. Where do I order them? And that's just too much. So I'm going to plant what I'm familiar with differently than I did last year, but like I grew onions this year. I planted onion seeds, um, which is new, right? But it's an onion. So I've eaten onions before. It's not a brand new species of food that I've never had before. But I'm hoping to get there in a year or two that I'll try a brand new species once I get the basics down. And then the other thing that is important to come to and I had to come to is you are not a failure if your food doesn't grow properly. If you have seedlings that die, if you have a hailstorm or you took a trip to Japan during key watering season and didn't and your roommates didn't help water because you didn't ask them to. That happened to me and that shut me off from gardening for a long time. Well, 
I've worked through those things. Those are not valid reasons why I shouldn't garden, but they were valid reasons to stop and pay attention to my emotions and to um, work through the, the thought processes and fully process those situations. Because as an emotional reminder, can't get past to talk without it, right? Um, hard things that happen that become, that are unexplained or you don't process through become trauma. Hard things that happen that you do process through become wisdom. So the thing that was trauma for me for a lot of years that I just thought I was bad at gardening, I had a black thumb, this was not going to work. And then I got to the place where, um, I got to the place where I realized that has nothing to do with me. I was learning. I didn't know what to do. I went on a surprise trip. Um, that was all those are things that are overcomable. Those are just decisions and choices and accidents and learning opportunities and, and, and failures, but not ending, right? Not ending failures, just something that didn't work and we try again. So that allowed me to garden. And working with Sarah um, with the, the CSA gardens in the front yards also allowed me to get through that and realize that there's no magical person that's really good at gardening. Maybe some people are better than others naturally, but it's a skill that can be learned just like anything else. So you have the ability to garden something everywhere you are. Thank you, Sarah. The comments come in 15 seconds after you type them. So if that seemed like forever for that to come through and me to respond, that's why. Okay, so when we have, sorry, lost my train of thought. So set up. I needed so much more fat than I ate today. I am 100% off. <laughs> okay, we're doing that. We're processing through. So look at what reasons you're really doing it. Be honest with yourself. Are you really gardening because you don't have time, or is there other things that are keeping you from gardening? And if it is a time issue, which it is for all of us, we all have to choose what we're doing with our time. We all will fill our schedule up. Some of us fill our schedule up with more rest and YouTube videos than other people, right? But we all use 24 hours every 24 hours. There's a really great book, by the way, called How to Live on 24 Hours a Day by Arnold somebody, I think. Um, it's a public domain book, and you can get it on Kindle um, and Kindle and Audible. It's at least on Kindle for free. It's super fun. The guy's tongue-in-cheek. It's great. Um, is how to budget your time. Um, it's kind of the beginning of those efficiency things, but it doesn't go so crazy as to schedule all your time, but has great thoughts. Anyway, how to live on 24 hours a day. Great book. Um, you have 24 hours to spend, and so do I, and we spend it every day. And you can't be in debt. You have to spend your 24 hours, or you can choose to spend it on things you want to do and things that you are wishing you would rather have done different things, right? You can choose it, but you can never save it, and you can never overspend it. That really helped put me in a great frame of mind in, okay, what is important in my time? For me, as we get back to that, what other benefits do gardening have? It is calming. It makes me be home more, which is a big deal because I schedule my time. It's really good when I know that I need to schedule an hour or two in the garden because then I do it. Um, it's good for me, just like it's good for me to walk my dog, that I have a dog and that we go on walks because I go outside because I would just not, I would not do that sometimes. So um, think about benefits more than just your own food because yeah, maybe someone else can grow better food than you and they're just down the street. Um, maybe someone else can be at the farmer's market. Maybe someone else, you know, can whatever, but you also have more benefit than just your own food. Um, and your own energy that you put into it, which is great, but also you are going to get the benefit additionally of sunshine, relaxation, grounding, soil bacteria exposure, um, learning, feeling accomplished, especially if you have a desk job or a computer job where you literally never see a finished product because it's not tangible. Garden, it's super helpful. <laughs> Um, and then you can have the processing. What can you teach your kids? What can you teach your kids about what you're doing? Um, teach them what you know, not what you're trying to figure out, or help them learn. Help them see you can do things you don't know yet, and you can learn as you go. And here's what we do. We watch these YouTube videos, or here's some good books, or we learn from someone. Um, or we just try it, and we might fail, and that's okay, too. So, so many lessons, so much helpful things that you can do um, in gardening. And after I got over the I'm a failure at gardening because I went on a Japan trip and my garden died and that was 
and I was done um, for 10 years or more. I didn't garden. Um, once I got over that, the benefits just came out the woodwork of what was good about gardening. And I then don't feel bad about investing a little bit of money and a little bit of time in gardening instead of just quick and go to the store kind of thing. So walk through, work through. Okay, resource number one, find someone to help you that you know, that would be great. Not all of us have that, but do. Go to farmer's markets, chat them up, talk to them about what they use, how do they do it. Find some biodynamic farms, more and more are cropping up all the time. Joel Salatin is really huge. He has polyface farms back east, um, and he talks about biodynamic farming, how to utilize crop rotation and chicken to crop rotation and cow to crop rotation and all of that. So. Um, how to Live on 24 Hours a Day was one book title. How to Live on 24 Hours a Day by Arnold somebody. Um, is that the one you mean? Um, so Joe, Joel Salatin is really great. He's got videos and books and a website and he teaches. We have live conferences again in the future. We will. Um, so he does all of those things. Um, there is some, if you're in this area, there are multiple biodynamic farms. Dumnomo Farm is here, and I'm trying to think of the other one. I, I always forget the name of the other one. Um, so those farms are here. Go volunteer. Um, they're always going to take volunteers. They don't always have working position for CSAs, but I bet you if you come offer to pull weeds for two hours with no strings attached, um, except that you just get to chat and learn, I bet you can do that. Um, when right before COVID hit, I was wondering about learning with gardening and I was wondering if I wanted to get a part-time job at the garden, um, place here in town. And I actually had, I found my application the other day and I think it was March of last year. Um, so it was right before, um, everything closed down and, um, it would, you know, I was thinking about it cause there's a lot of hours and I have a business but it wasn't for the money, it wasn't for the job, it was for the experience. And what would it be like if I transplanted thousands of little seedlings into better pots and like how to do that and how to work on that. So that was, you know, that's a possibility. Find a garden shop and work there and do the menial work and just be around. And if you're able to ask questions anytime you can do that, you know, so that's one thing that can be helpful. Um, find a friend, find a friend who's gardening and just ask to go help garden. Um, they may want to do it with you and kind of make a bigger garden. Um, and they may want to, um, like they may want to do more things cause you're helping them. You guys can kind of co-garden, um, in your, your neighbor's backyard or your backyard, or you may find that they teach you things that you can take away, um, and do next year or the year after. Um, so things like that. Glade Road Orchard. I think I know where that is. They have goats too. Um, I think I've met them. I used to live on Glade Road. That's where we had our farm and our garden when I was growing up. Okay. Um, so take away the barriers. Yes, we know nutrient-dense food is good. Here are some other benefits. Take away the barriers. I'm giving you my outline in my head. Um, and then think of the benefits for you and decide if it's the right thing. So you may come to the end of that conversation with a different decision than you thought you were going to have. You still may not garden, um, or you may decide you only do a few things, like some herbs, things like that. Um, but you may, um, yes, decide that gardening would actually be a great idea um, and that you're okay with it, and you're okay if you fail, and you're okay if the hail comes. Um, the other thing I want to tell you, there are techniques for gardening well that make your plants so much stronger and healthier than other plants. So... That is something that I learned this last year. There is a hailstorm. I was able to get my most of my stuff covered because um, it happened to be small enough to put little like plastic pots over all of them when we had hail last year. But they just they, they did fine. It was okay. I was really worried about stuff, and it was fine. And I think it would have been fine actually. <clears throat> um, I wasn't going to risk it, but I think it would have been fine. So. Focusing, just like with our health, we can solidify our body, we can make our body stronger, um, and then we can handle stress better. <coughs> so just like we do that with our health, we can do that with our gardens, with our plants. Same principles apply, which I love. My water's in the other room. 
<clears throat> this can be a problem. <clears throat> I've been talking for a lot of hours. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is kind of some practicals. Okay, so resources. People you know, books, and YouTube. Find biodynamic people. Um, I just did a... Um, Started oregano grows back each year more than I know what to do with very hardy. Yes, there are things that we think of um, that really once you get a spot, they can stay forever. Or you can transplant them to someone else. So don't be paralyzed at, is this the perfect right place for this? If it's not, just transplant it somewhere else. Um, and also, I think it's called a pot in, pottinger's garden. It's a French term. Shay Elliott, someone I follow. I love her. That's one of the things she talks about. Um, but it's kind of a garden that is very mis mismatched. And then she calls hers a market garden, which is a garden that's planted in rows and very like this crop is here and this crop is here and this crop is here. So um, that's something I had to embrace too, is that I learned gardening in very neat rows or this is a square foot gardening method, which I think gets you closer, but it's still a monocrop usually. And what I really like is in nature, it all grows together, and you can actually get so many more plants that way. And not everything grows perfectly everywhere together, but it's a great way to experiment. One of the things I learned this year watching different YouTube people is that chamomile is very protective in a bug way, um, but also it's like very good companion plant for other reasons. And so this lady has chamomile in most of her garden beds. It just kind of grows up as a, a volunteer, and she plants around it. Um, and it spreads, and that's great. So things like that, things like oregano, marigolds, um, you know, things like that. So I moved again from my last garden, which was beautiful, and I'm so sad. Um, so I'm making new garden here. I've bought this house now, so I will be in it for at least a little while. Um, so I'm starting over in some of these perennials, um, but it's going to be really exciting um, to do that. And I'm not going to be sad if I decide it didn't work and I have to move it somewhere else. So um, that'll be good. Okay. Okay, so why dense foods we talked about? Mindsets to kind of work through. Do you actually have enough time or are you making excuses of time because you're scared for some reason, in short? <laughs> um, then I want to talk about, so we did the basic, like, of course we're going to grow a whole bunch of cabbage for sauerkraut if you love sauerkraut. Um, carrots could be great. Um, look at what things grow well in your area. There is something to growing seasonally for your area. Um, and that's probably foods you should be eating. Now, don't grow foods you absolutely hate and aren't going to eat anyway. Grow a tiny bit of them. Try to stretch yourself, but don't grow a bumper crop of something that you know no one in your family likes. Right? So be smart about that. Just because it's gaps, just because Holly or I did it, or just because your YouTube friend you know, loves it the most, um, does not mean that you need to do that for sure. Um, you need to do stuff that makes sense to your family, and then you're just exper experimenting and figuring out what to do after that. Jill, sage, yarrow, mint, thyme, echinacea all come back each year also. Ah, and oregano. That's so exciting. I'm so excited. Okay. Um, there's two major categories of GAPS foods that I have been thinking about. As I've been thinking about this, there's kind of two categories. One are foods that are, I'm sorry. There's two categories that are different than foods that most people garden with. So most people garden with things that are just summer fresh foods. They grow cucumbers and they eat cucumbers. Some people do can cucumbers, so they might grow enough actually for that. But not everyone. A lot of people just grow a couple bushes to have some fresh cucumbers. Um, they grow tomato plants just for the summer. Um, things like that, which is totally great. So number one, growing food for eating fresh. Delicious, wonderful, beautiful. Number two, growing food for storage, mostly fermenting or freezing potentially um, because seasonally growing food and freezing is really important. Pumpkins are one of the most important uh, and best winter squash vegetables that you can have. You only get pumpkins once a year or you buy it in a can in puree, right? I don't know why we grow watermelons and have them almost all year round, but you only get pumpkins from October to December, right? Um, or even less than that. So it is really, really important to think about what you're doing, what your plan is, what your family's eating, um, and to the best of your ability, plant things that help. Now, this is not just GAPS garden, right? This is whole food, real food eating gardening too. Number one, foods for fun, foods for fresh. 
Number two, we have gardening for preserving, for fermenting. And then number three, we have the foods that you don't necessarily get, like herbs, like other herbs, not just these, but actually, Jill, you have that, yarrow. Yarrow is great. Many, many herbs are so nutritionally dense, you're basically planting wild edibles for you to forage in your own yard. Um, many of them come up on their own. They regenerate once you get them in and established. They do no, you have no more work to do besides throw the hose over them sometimes. Um, that's all going to be super helpful. And they give medicinal value to you. And you don't have to go plan a huge trip to go find some echinacea patch in the woods away from pesticides, you hope. Like, you don't have to do that because it's in your own yard. Um, and then you can dry your echinacea. This is something that I'm really excited about. Um, I love looking for wild edibles because, again, scheduled time to go to the mountains for a purpose. I'm seeing a theme in my life here. Um, but other things with the, the um, wild edibles is you can plant them in your own yard. Just like you have dandelions that come up in your own yard, you can plant other things. So, Sorry. <sighs> so we have... Um, Things that maybe we consider wild edibles, which you may be nervous about. Um, you may be, you know, not sure about identification. So you'd be a lot safer buying those yarrow or mint or sage or whatever um, in a seed that you know you planted the right thing and you know where it is. But then it keeps coming up and you just forage it from your, from your own property. So those are kind of the three things that are different about GAPS. Um, we'd still plant foods for fresh, um, which maybe are going to be a little different than what other people do. Not necessarily, but potentially, depending on where you are on gaps or your healing whole food diet. Um, number two, we want, we're going to do kind of what they used to do, tons and tons of a certain thing, because you're going to ferment it. You're going to put all your cabbages in a big barrel in your basement. Man, I'm so excited to try that. Someday. My grandpa grew up with that. Hungarian. They had a huge barrel of cabbages that were fermented in a brine in the basement and they threw a new one in and took a took a you know old one out and just they rotated the cabbages through the barrel. So pretty cool. Um, so things like that. Super fun to do jar fermenting, to do pickles, to do um, or fermented cucumbers, to do I did tomatoes. Um, they're pretty yummy. I we'll see how long they keep. They may be something that I should have eaten faster than later. Um, kind of forgot about them. Peppers ferment really well. Onions ferment really well. Um, mixtures of that kind of thing. Doing salsa, doing fermented salsa that will keep for a long time. Some of these need to be in cold storage or fridge, and some of them are okay if as long as your house isn't getting above seventy-five on a regular basis. So that's what we do. So for gaps or healing foods, we're gonna. Build, do a whole bunch more things for preserving or fermenting. So like the pumpkin, um, ice cube trays is a great idea uh, or, you know, other kind of ways to do. And then we have nutrient dense foods you wouldn't normally find, or you may um, want to forage, um, but you don't want to forage, but you want the food that to forage. You don't have time or you don't have, you live two hours away from the nearest open space. Um, and four hours away from mountains. I know I'm super spoiled here because I'm an hour away from a lot of foraging. Um, but I don't have the skill to make sure I'm not always eating poisonous things. So, yes, jalapenos do ferment great. So there's lots of things to do, lots of different foods that give you very dense nutrition. Um, I bought a book called, hold on, Nutritional Herbology. Oh, let me grab it for you. I love this book. I don't look at it nearly as much as I want to have time for. Nutritional Herbology, A Reference Guide to Herbs by Mark Peterson. Looks like, it looks like that. Bought off Amazon probably or something. But it talks about the different herbs. It doesn't have pictures, unfortunately. Um, if you're in the Northern Colorado area, there is a guy, um, Cattail Bob is his name. You find him with that. I'm sure he's on Facebook, but he does wild edibles classes where he walks around areas here and helps identify them. And he's written a couple books. So you can have the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter of what the picture is of that, that 
thing that you're maybe going to forage. And then he also has poisonous things so that you know the difference. He does lookalikes that you can look up other places in the book. He has two or three editions of different herbs um, or edibles that are in nature. And there's other things too, but um, it's good to find someone in your specific region if you're going to do foraging. Um, the other thing is certain things are okay to transplant. Make sure you're doing everything legally, um, but there are certain areas or certain plants that you could gather a little bit of seed from that plant and then go take and plant it in your own garden. So you don't have to make the four hour trip to the mountains. Um, I did bring a little sage plant from some private property that we were camping on. Um, and I took a little sage, I dug it up, um, and planted it at my house. And, um, that was something really sweet to have through the winter. Um, and we'll see if what it does in the spring here. But, um, so those kind of things are really helpful because you can support and help, um, your body get the right nutrition with these very, very dense foods. So these things right here, sorry. So these have names. So you, this is not how you identify them, but once you know what you have, this actually talks about um, the folk and historical use, and then it has a nutritional profile. That's what this chart is right here. Sorry, this chart right here. You guys are rock stars for sticking with me. My brain is so shot today. Okay, so if we go to, let's go to something that we know. Milk thistle leaf. A lot of us have milk thistles or know that it's good, right? Milk thistle derives its name from the milky sap that comes from stems and leaves. Its annual grows up to 10 feet high. Uh, like most thistles, it has prickly leaves. It's identified by its spine-ridged reddish-purple flowers. Okay, you guys all know what I'm talking about now? It's native to the Middle East, but now grows all over the temperate region of the North America. Um, most commercially available milk thistle is concentrated extract of the sap. Processing the bitter latex in this manner allows the flavonoids to be standardized, usually to 80% silymarin, and the prickles and spines of the plant to be avoided by the consumer. So they make it easy for you. <laughs> milk thistle has a long folk history of successfully treating liver disorders, which have been confirmed by scientific study. Um, that's why you can buy that one as a supplement. So it talks about liver stuff, medicinal properties, antioxidant, liver protectant, liver cell proliferant. So it tells you so much information. The flavonoids in milk thistle are responsible for its actions. They have the ability to prevent liver destruction and enhance liver function. Sweet. Who knew those things, right? I just love what this book does. And then you look and you go, huh, chromium um, has, it's very high in chromium. It's very high in fat. Um, it's very high in iron, um, it's very high in manganese, it's very high in phosphorus, selenium, tin, and zinc. Well, how many of us maybe struggle with getting selenium in or phosphorus? I was just talking with someone today. Phosphorus can be a really important um, mineral for balancing our sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. What if you don't get the foods that are high in phosphorus? Um, so there's things like this that are just so high in dense um, in that. Uh, what's the thing on purslane? Should look at purslane. Purslane is super high in vitamin C. Like we're trying to find vitamin C sources. Well, there's a weed that grows probably in your backyard that helps with um, your vitamin C status. That if you ate every day in your salads, you actually probably wouldn't need to take a vitamin C supplement. So that's what herbs are so, so good at. Um, and these kind of plants, like things we categorize as herbs, right? Things in here that aren't vegetables, um, but they have this more concentrated thing. But we think of herbs as basil, parsley, oregano. You know, we have such a limited thought of herbs. There's actually a ton. Okay. Um, I really want to look at purslane now. But this is a super awesome book. And I always like rediscover how awesome I like it. And I think, oh, I should read it cover to cover, just like the Art of Fermentation. Awesome book. Okay, 277. 277 is purslane, or purslane, I don't know how to say it. Dandelion and purslane combination. Wow, that's exciting. Okay, apparently that's the only one they have. Dandelion and purslane combination is used to fight chronic infections. These herbs work to stimulate immune response, enhance the body's response to stress, reduce glandular inflammation, and protect the liver from organic, common organic poisons. Um, Person herbs contain mucolid, mucolid, 
mucilaginous compounds that enhance digestion and absorb toxins from the digestive tract. They also contain essential fatty acids that maintain healthy circulatory system. This herb has been used to treat dyspepsia, enteritis, uh, stomach issues, um, high blood pressure, candidiasis, and digestive tract infections. And I'm pretty sure it has C, vitamin C, but I'm not sure because it's not putting it here. Anyway, so when we look at these things, right, the ultimate thing is I close up a little bit shorter than normal. Number one, if you don't know how to garden or don't feel like you have the skills or resources, there are resources available. If you feel like you don't have the energy to grow your own stuff this year because you're doing gaps intro, great, grow it next year. You know, no problem with this. But what can you do this year? Can you grow a couple herbs that we're going to keep coming up every year? It's a great list that Jill put in the chat. Are you going, could you go to a garden once a month um, or have a friend who gardens invite you over every time she does a major thing like transplanting, um, planting seeds and then transplanting seeds and then putting them outside? Um, can you, can you go help for that? Um, can you grow a couple cabbages? Can you um, grow some echinacea seeds, you know, whatever it is that you feel like is in your realm. The first year I started growing, I grew some herbs in a bucket and I was, it was great. It was a good practice and that's all I did. And it was very manageable with what I could handle. And then I've just been able to slowly expand, not as I have more time cause I don't, but as I understand that this is good for me, it's good for me to garden and it's, not as overwhelming because I'm not afraid of making mistakes like I was in the beginning because I practiced with something small that I wouldn't feel like a complete failure if I did. And I worked through why I felt like a failure. So number one, try to figure out why you can't garden, won't garden, etc. See if there's things that you can change and see if there's things that you can um, support or learn in ways that are safe, small enough and manageable. Number two, when we garden for gaps, we want to think about um, the things that we can do. Sorry, when we garden for gaps, we're thinking about the benefits, not just of eating really, really good food, but also having um, good time outside in the dirt, good detoxing, et cetera, et cetera. Number three, we garden because it helps us know where our food is coming from and have a connection to it and have our kids have a connection and learn and teach them. There's so many benefits to gardening. Um, number four, we look at what we garden. Um, why do we garden? Um, it's not just because this is what everyone does. These are the plants that were at Home Depot. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a great way to start. Um, but as you get into it, as you're planning our Gardening for Gaps series, we hope to, to kind of make this a bit of a series. This is going to be about thinking about it in terms of a little more old fashioned, not conforming with modern lifestyle and taste, but actually about preserving and fermenting and nutrition, right? That's why we're eating for fun and for nutrition, for enjoyment and for nutrition. And so what is the nutritional value for what you're planting? Um, anything you plant is going to be better than what you buy at the store, 100% all the time. But there are things like purslane, which you may not have to try to plant <laughs> because it's going to grow up in your garden anyway, that you can add to salads to get a huge benefit to your body. So doing those things and then finding ways to preserve them that retain their nutrition or even increase their nutrition, um, which is what ferments do. So um, any questions? I'll ask that. It'll take 15 seconds for it to even get to me. So I'm going to just ramble for a couple of minutes while people's questions maybe come in or comments. Um, and, you know, just our idea for this is to do, you know, a series of short videos instructional, not of like, here's how to do this because it's we're awesome. But like, hey, we maybe have learned a step or two ahead of where you are in 50, 70 percent of things. And you're 10 steps ahead of us in a whole bunch of other things. Um, but, you know, what is it that we can we can do? And also just let's do it together. Let's encourage each other. Let's think through why we're doing things. Why am I not doing certain things? Um, why am I buying this at the store still? What recipes on in the gaps book could I do I not make because we don't have those vegetables here? But they're just they we could grow them here. Um, they're just not things that we have that the UK does or whatever, right? And so we can explore and expand and be in that place um, and make it work for you. 
Um, oh, Jill, thank you for saying that. Yes, kale is great. Even in the heat, kale is like all year round, man. You get a good kale plant. My parents' kale plants never died. They're just huge and producing the whole year, even through our huge snowstorm. I think they even survived our last snowstorm. I'm not sure. Chives are fun. Herbs and veggies in a pot. My gardener friend would want me to say, if you plant um, mint, plant it in a pot because it will spread and grow everywhere in your yard. Um, so do that in a contained place. <laughs> um, you can do that. That's how I started because I was moving a lot and um, I would just grow things and move them with me, which was great. Um, or I'd have an empty space. I've done this when I've shared houses with people and it's not even my house. I'm just you know renting a room from them. And there just was a discussion about what space was available and what I could do. So those things are really great. You can plant something everywhere. Um, I do not recommend hydroponics. That conversation question often comes up. Hydroponics is not the way the plants were designed to grow. You often put synthetic chemical vitamins and minerals into water. Um, so they grow, but the nutrition is not there. And the energy is not there and the soil bacteria is not there. Um, so you're missing most of what we want in good, healthy food. So if you're going to um, bother, and I don't, I don't know, but isn't it better than store-bought? I don't, I don't know. Maybe, but maybe not. Um, and then a lot of store-bought is hydroponic anyway. So maybe it's better when you do it yourself, but I just wouldn't waste the time or money to do it. I would find other ways to grow food. Um, people do winter trays of greens all year round. Um, there's lots of things that you can do to grow food through the winter, um, inside and out. Okay. Well, thank you for the conversation, ladies that were on and chatting and everyone that watched and everyone watching the replay. Um, thanks for liking and subscribing. That does help get this video out. Um, thank you for putting up with my brain today. Uh, sometimes it's hard to keep these videos on because they are so not my best teaching moment, but that's the point, right? That's why I keep it up because you guys, we're here for community. We're here to help each other, um, not to put on a production. And it's good to be efficient and, um, you know, put together. That's a really good plan. That shows respect. Um, but some days being put together is not enough because your brain doesn't say the words right. So anyway, it's great to be with you all. Thanks for being on. Um, have such a lovely evening and happy gardening. Um, definitely comment below on this video of things that you have questions about. Um, resources. Um, we really want to connect with local people. If you know any local people or want to know a specific local person that we could maybe look for, <coughs> that would be really great. So um, do that. Put comments below. Put comments of what you would love to see. Um, and uh, any ideas or suggestions on how we can build a community around this gardening for gaps um, thing. So, okay, have such a lovely evening. You are welcome. Thank you for being on. And uh, it's fun to be with you all and to share. I am so floored that I'm so excited about gardening because I used to be so stressed about it, but it is so lovely and so good. And I just am really passionate about it now. So glad to be having this conversation and I will see